Hi everybody, my name is Jessica Davis and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager for Fear Free. Thank you for joining us for Pandemic Puppies, Puppy Socialization During a Disease Outbreak. Presenting today is Rachel Lees, RVT, KPA, CPT, VTS Behavior, and she will be discussing the importance of the socialization period, desensitization and classical counter conditioning, safety techniques and ideas, and more. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to enter them in the Q&A box. We will have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We're so excited to have Rachel here with us today. So on that note, Rachel, take it away. Awesome. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me today. I am very, very excited about this lecture. Um, I was telling Jessica before we started that, you know, even though this is a pandemic, and I know that this is a very, very hard time for a lot of us, I mean, it's stressful mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, so there's a lot, but I did want to, you know, again, this lecture was a lot of fun to create. Um, and it really made me want puppies. So <laughs> I, I feel like all of my friends out there all, you know, having kids and I'm, I'm like, okay, I need to have a baby. I want to have a baby puppy. <laughs> so, um, and again, this kind of brought some light to the pandemic for me. So thank you guys for all being here with me today. Um, so anyways, today's lecture is going to be about puppy socialization during this time. And again, I think there are a lot of people who are panicking and who are really worried about puppies during this time frame. And, you know, we've done such a good job at educating pet owners and educating ourselves on the importance of, of socialization. And, and my biggest thing that we're going to run through today is, is, you know, kind of the objectives and, and looking at what exactly is socialization. And not that this isn't going to be a problem with the pandemic, but we're going to try to find some positives because that's me <laughs> and we're going to try to find a lot of different um, ways that we can still do socialization at a six foot distance so let me go ahead okay so our objectives today again how can COVID-19 impact socialization so we're going to kind of talk about what exactly puppy socialization is and how we can again work around this with our current limitations. I want to make sure we understand some of the terms that we use in puppy socialization. So again, things like positive reinforcement, desensitization, classical counter conditioning, and again, review how this is used very briefly. So then that way we can jump into actually some of the techniques that we're going to use. And then I really want to go through safe and healthy exposure. How can we do this by with our puppies? How can you guys coach this to pet parents? And if you're a pet parent yourself, how can you do this um, and still stay safe? Stay safe. <laughs> um, and then again, I like to make sure I give you guys some tools to have in your toolbox because again, if your puppy gets too close or for example, um, you're working on meeting another, another dog, I want you to be able to have a way that you can recall your puppy back quickly. Um, and again, be able to have some sort of a greeting with ritual for the future. So that's where we're gonna go into some name orientation and targeting as well. So moving on. Um, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm a little newer to the speaker world, but I've been doing more and more lectures. And every time I do a lecture, I, I always include Leonardo DiCaprio. I, he, you know, I was, a, a young teen in the years of Titanic and, you know, James Cameron. And anyways, I wanted to include Leo. And, you know, so I found, again, light. This is a very serious, serious pandemic, but I want us all to kind of loosen up. We're going to, we're going to get through this. Um, so I, I couldn't find Leo with a mask on unless I was looking at man in the iron mask. So um, I put a mask on, but then I was also thinking that today was the I don't know the exact anniversary, but today is the anniversary of the Titanic actually sinking. So um, again, just a fun fact for the day. Um, and again, our hearts will go on. Moving on. So um, again, going back to this, what is puppy socialization? So I think of it, I was trying to come up with some definitions here because again, 
you can look at socialization and I feel like what a lot of us think of this as sometimes is meeting other dogs, meeting people. Um, and, and that's kind of what we look at. But really socialization is a way that I, I again, I kind of came up with four different definitions and how I wanted to think about it. So I think of it as, again, we want to create a dog that's going to be comfortable, welcomed, and confident in our society and with our social norms, which again, right now our social norms are a little bit odd, but we're going to, again, rebound from this and we're going to jump back in and, and be our normal selves. But I also want to make sure that they learn appropriate social skills with other puppies and different species. So again, I'm going to go through some ways we can try to do that during this time frame as well. Again, with socialization, we want to create a dog that can think rationally in a situation. So again, if they do get worried, if they do get concerned, what can we do to move them away um, without creating more increased fear, stress, and anxiety? Um, and again, we want to build a strong foundation for lifelong learning. So with all this being said, is this truly inhibited by the pandemic? Again, when we look at, yes, they can't meet many new people, absolutely, but what about the rest of the world and the rest of the world that they can interact with? And that's where I wanted to go in our next step where, again, there's two sides to every story. So again, not, and again, I am not making light of the pandemic. I understand how serious this is. And um, my heart is with you know anybody who's been horribly touched by the pandemic. And um, again, I hope and pray every day that you know any at, that the world stays as safe as possible during this time. But if I have to look at it and try to find that silver lining, there can be potentially some positives. Um, you know, we with this, I'm I'm not the greatest at being creative. This lecture really made me have to put my creative hat on. Um, but again, we can be creative and we get to think outside the box a little bit and come up with some different ways and we get to use our imaginations in a way and maybe put on some costumes. I'm going to go into that stuff and, and maybe do some role playing and, and again, there's going to be some different stuff that you're going to be able to do to try to create yourself in a different light to be able to get your dog used to some different things. Um, I'm also, again, the way I had to think about this is that I think it's actually gonna be really nice for your dog to be able to have some social boundaries. Um, you know, again, when kind of going through and researching this lecture and looking back at all the different things that I've done in the past, you know, again, a lot of the times we usually will, you know, puppies go up to people, we always hand them a bunch of treats. So what puppy starts to learn is, wow, people are awesome, but people also mean I need to beeline to them, jump up and get, get food and they're really exciting. So again, this might actually give them a little impulse control um, because it's gonna teach them and we might have actually have a better chance at maybe teaching some appropriate greetings in the future. Um, these guys will be independence pros because again, your puppies will love separation and my goal is, I hear what you're saying. You're like, Rachel, how is that going to happen when you are, um, when you're working from home? But again, you're going to get a lot of time to practice these things. And what I mean by independence pro is that your puppy might do really well being in the house with the owners and being able to be separated. Um, working at a behavioral only facility, this is one of the biggest challenges I feel a lot of our owners end up coming to. And again, unfortunately, sometimes these are for dogs that have aggression that can't be with guests and things, but it's nice to be able to say, hey, honey, you're going away for a little bit, go into your house, work on some food enrichment. And with this, you guys have an opportunity to be practicing that every day, or we can be coaching our owners to do that every day. But again, some of the negatives we look at is, you know, again, we're gonna have limited interaction with unfamiliar people. And like I said, I tried to make that silver lining. Um, again, we're going to have limited interaction with other puppies and different species. You know, again, sometimes during the socialization period, you know, going to pet stores and being able to see, you know, birds and, you know, hamsters and, and a lot of these other maybe cats that are up for adoption and being able to smell a lot of these different species is helpful. So again, we're not going to have a lot of that. Um, and again, with this, you know, again, 
there's a pro and a con. <laughs> um, we have the potential to create a Velcro puppy. So again, increased anxiety with alone time with when the owner actually has to leave. So again, with this, I'm gonna go into a little bit more again with that socialization. I have quotation marks in my hand, like I'm giving the bunny ears type thing. Um, but again, when we look at socialization, how can we make this, um, how can we make our puppies successful for these things? So again, try to remember the silver lining. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time is Silver Linings Playbook. And you know, again, when you can have Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper jumping in a lecture, why not? Um, and again, when life gives you lemons, try to make lemonade. Um, so then that way, you know, we can, let's see. So let me go in here. So speaking the puppy's language. So again, with this, we, again, be your puppy's advocate. So the biggest thing to remember is making sure, again, I'm not gonna hit on body language really hard, but making sure that, again, these clients understand, you know, again, what does socialization look like? And, you know, body language wise, you know, again, what are signs of fear, stress, and anxiety? Which again, if you have gone through the fear-free um, certification, um, you're, you should be a professional at knowing these things. But also again, what are things that you should be looking for? And again, I usually tell pet owners, you're gonna be watching for any weight shifting, lip licking, seeing the ears back, a paw lift, a tail tuck, a freezing, yawning, or a crouch posture. So again, if they're going up and they're gonna be interacting with a person at a distance, or they're going to be interacting with an object, um, again, if you start to see those things, that's gonna just go, okay, we're not gonna push things, we're gonna take a few steps back and give ourselves some space. So again, learning that is involved with puppy socialization is, you know, again, we're, we're gonna start off by doing an any, with any puppy, um, we're gonna use positive reinforcement. So again, that's typically where we're adding something to increase the likelihood of a behavior. Um, with that, I recommend to use conditioned reinforcers, or again, I'll use a lot of clicker training. And again, if you can't use an actual clicker, because I know, again, not that you can't use it, it just has something else in your hand, it has something else you could potentially, you know, in, not infect, but you're gonna get germs on. Um, you can use tongue click that can be under a mask while you're out and about. So again, I'll do like a sound with my tongue. And again, I've had a lot of practice. Um, so you'll get better and better as you keep practicing. But this allows reinforcement to happen the moment a wanted behavior occurs. So again, that click is matched up with the treat. And again, in other scenarios, I might say you can match it up with, you know, playing tug or, you know, being pet or having some sort of phrase. But for socialization, I really, really, really want you guys to be recommending to use food because that's a really good way for the owner to be able to tell, is the puppy enjoying things or are they not? Because obviously if they're not, they're gonna stop eating. Um, and then again, with this, we're also using desensitization. And unfortunately, I feel desensitization is gonna be a big part of where we're at, obviously, um, especially when it comes to people. Because again, puppies obviously need to be attached to a human. And if you're going to go up and meet a new person, we can't be within six feet of them. So um, we're gonna be presenting a lot of the people, at least at a lesser intensity by using distance. Um, if we're looking at seeing um, and working with different objects or different sounds and things, again, that might be keeping things at a lesser volume or again, starting with, you know, if say a dog's scared of a box, you're gonna start with a smaller box and then make a larger box. And again, with desensitization, we're gonna add in classical counter conditioning. So again, the goal is to change the way that the animal feels about the stimulus. So in that situation, like, so say for instance, you're walking down the street and your puppy sees, you know, a really tall person that has a, I don't know, say they were walking around being fun, they had a top hat on and they had their mask and they had gloves and a bigger coat. 
I don't know, I live in Cleveland and, you know, last week I was walking around with no coat on and today there was snow flurries. I, I don't know if anybody else is experiencing this craziness, but um, so again, I'm saying a big coat because it could, it could happen. Um, and your puppy looks a little concerned. Again, your goal is to be clicking the moment your puppy looks at the scary stimulus to be able to change the way that they feel about it. So in that way they go, wow, seeing scary people makes awesome stuff happen. So again, how do we create a safe and healthy exposure for puppies? Um, and again, looking at that with human interaction. So with that definition of socialization I gave, how do we keep everybody safe? So I really did, I, I tried, I tried to come up with some really fun creative stuff and it was hard because looking at a lot of the facts with the pandemic and COVID-19, again, if right now the virus, if it's on a different surface, so it, you know, again, if somebody interacts with a piece of cardboard, it's gonna be on the surface for potentially 24 hours. Um, if it's, I was like, well, great. What if you carried a cooler and you set it down and you know, the, you could ask somebody to reach in and toss your puppy treats. Again, in plastic and stainless steel, the virus is gonna last up to 72 hours. So again, that's not safe. We can't be recommending things like that. I really was trying. Um, so what I, my biggest recommendation that I wanted to say is again, take your puppy out on potentially a six foot lead. Um, cause I think that's, I, again, I usually always like to make sure it's an actual, you know, lead retractable leashes are not my favorite. I feel like they unlock. We have a lot of challenges with those. Um, but again, with that, if you did it like a six foot or an eight foot lead, it does give your puppy a little bit that they could go up and get a little closer than you can, um, to potentially sniff the person and things of that nature. Um, so again, it can limit contact. In a, in a way where they can still go up and potentially have some sort of an interaction while you are at a safe distance. Um, I, a mentor, colleague, and friend of mine, I'm actually excited to call her a friend, Debbie Martin, um, who is the author of Puppy Start Right uh, with her husband, Ken Martin. Um, I was listening to a lecture with her and one of my favorite dog trainers, Hannah Braggett, ugh, Brannigan, on her Drinking from the Toilet podcast. And they were talking about how, again, there were, and Debbie had some awesome ideas of things you could do just inside the home, which again, costumes. You know, I know we are running at our behavior practice um, a virtual class. So this is something else, again, for some of you that are interested, please, at the end of my lecture, my email will be attached. I am happy to give you guys information on our virtual classes because that's something that anybody you could do from anywhere because we're usually doing them on, I think we're doing them on Amazon Chime right now. Um, but again, that way the owner can stay in the house. You're having instruction um, from one of our Karen Pryor certified training partners and our other technicians that we can actually go ahead and coach you on doing some of these things. But I love the idea of a costume. And I know Marianne, our tech who's doing this, is, has been like, okay, you guys got to come in a costume. <laughs> so every week the owner comes in a different costume. Um, but again, you know, it might be great, you know, getting out the Halloween box and putting on some different wigs, putting on some different hats. Um, one of Debbie's amazing ideas that I thought was awesome was, you know, suggesting some different smells. Um, you know, again, how many times do we all have lotions and perfumes and soaps that we don't use very often. Again, I don't want anybody to get a rash um, if you're sensitive to those things. But again, we can make ourselves smell different, um, which again, would change up the training process and make, um, and make things again, a little bit different. So, um, and again, practice coming into, into the home in a costume with different smells, et cetera. So again, like you can leave the house, maybe go out in the garage, you know, spray yourself with a different perfume or something or cologne. And then you have your hat on and you have your, you know, maybe a big winter coat. You walk in with a crutch or a walker or a, a cane. And again, you're gonna look different. And it's a way that you are still exposing your puppy to some of these different things. Um, outside of the home, Again, opportunities to practice not greeting. So like I already had mentioned, seeing people does not always mean we get to interact. 
So with that being said, you're gonna, your puppy's gonna see people. But what I would personally suggest that you do is again, when you're working with an animal, even at a distance or a puppy, you're gonna have them close to you anyways. But again, when they look at that person and they see them walking by, I again would click to reinforce the behavior of, hey, you're looking at the person and giving them a treat. And the other part that I always think about is the puppy is doing an actual behavior. So if they're standing there with all four feet on the ground, not jumping, not pulling and tugging towards the person, you're also reinforcing a really amazing behavior of staying still at your side, which is awesome. Um, so again, that's something else we can also be reinforcing at the same time. So again, think of it as, again, that silver lining. Um, and again, you guys, again, stay at a six foot distance. I am by no means suggesting not to follow the recommendations of the uh, government and you know everybody's state representatives and things of that nature. Please, please follow all your recommendations. So I have a few videos and I'm gonna tell you guys this, is that my videos obviously were taken before the pandemic. Um, I did another lecture a while back and I was, I was really excited actually because I had some good ones. I pieced apart points where the dogs were at a distance, but it can show that these things can happen at a distance and it's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to hinder us any, in my opinion. So this first one, um, my best friend is um, the one in the corner, or uh, it, with, those are her kids. and. Um, since I don't have my own, I use my friend's kids to come in for my puppy stuff <laughs> and they get to meet puppies and play with them in a way. So um, anyways, and this was a dog named Ajax and he, I want to say was about, well, I want to say 14 weeks. So he's a little older, um, but you'll start to see some ways that again, you can do this at a distance. And it actually, I think, well, it helped Ajax a lot to be able to be at the safe distance. Because before this, I, this clip started, he actually stopped eating treats because Madden, it, who is my niece in the pink pants, um, she's being an average five-year-old. I mean, like she started waving her arms around and just being a five-year-old. So started to get a little uncomfortable. He increased his distance, moved away and I had to increase the value of the reinforcer. So here is where we're at. So, and again, Cam, it was cracking me up as I was watching this video because, you know, his shoes are flipping off. I, I'm i just, again, you guys were hopefully paying attention to the actual puppy and not little Cameron in the corner, but yeah. Moving on. So that kind of gives you some examples because again, now that probably wasn't six feet, but that puppy actually, I increased the value of the food by using peanut butter, but that puppy did much better being at a distance. And again, sometimes being right up next to the person can be really scary. So having a distance might actually be okay. Um, so one thing that I, again, wanted to bring to light is we're doing at our clinic um, for the puppy and puppy interaction. So how can we still provide safe socialization and actual socialization between dogs? Um, so we're doing puppy social parties. Um, we're calling, I think we're calling them like puppy social breaks. And this is for obviously clients that live in our area. So I'm in, um, we're, our practice is in uh, Olmstead Falls, Ohio. So um, 
we're doing them, I think on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And what we're doing is, is puppies only. So when we go out, our humans that are in charge, we're wearing PPE. So again, we have gloves on, we have, you know, um, jackets, we have masks, we're making sure that we're being safe, but we go out and we're collecting puppies curbside from the owners. And then we bring them in and we have a space where we're actually providing, like we have slides out, we have some different substrates, we have, you know, a baby gate, we have water, we have all these things. And then again, the puppies are getting a chance to have off-leash interactions with puppies in the same age group. So um, that has been actually really successful. We've had a lot of clients. I have some, some video on there in here as well for you guys to look at. Um, but, and then also what we're doing is we're putting and we're grabbing, um, we're giving the owners a Zoom link and um, they can actually watch. So then that way they can sit from their car and watch their puppies interact. This is not a full hour. I think we're having everybody, it's usually for a half hour, um, but it's been really successful. We're also, um, we started to do a puppy junior or a junior league where again, these puppies are coming in at around, um, it's once they're outside their socialization period. And again, a lot of them have their puppy friends that have graduated out with them, but now we're working on a little bit more of cued behavior and capturing behaviors like sit down and maybe a hand target and working on some of those things too with other animals in the, in the same area. So um, another thing I thought, again, I was listening to the lecture yesterday and um, a mock introduction, which again, a lot of people, you may have stuffed animals at home, like so if you have a, a like a small stuffed kitten that is maybe your child or um, a lot of the Melissa and Doug dogs are used like in our, I know in our behavior practice we use them. Um, and so we're not using live dogs, especially if we have a dog who's uh, fear-based aggressive towards dogs. Um, so again, I actually got a video of myself using this because I had a puppy who was really scared of another dog. So I wanted to actually do an introduction to a stuffed dog before I was going to do a live dog. Um, so I have video of that as well. But that's another great way that you can start to introduce to the to another animal in a way. It's uh, obviously it's not a live animal, but it at least gives them some sort of idea of what to expect. Um, and again, I was thinking if you if you had a friend or a family member that you could meet in a park and you guys stayed at a six foot distance and say they had a, you know, St. Bernard. I, I'm obsessed. I love St. Bernard's. That's my next dog. Um, it's yeah, they're my thing. Anyway, so say you, you know, you have a Yorkie and you want your Yorkie to be able to, you know, be fine seeing a bunch of other types of dogs. So if you have a friend who has a St. Bernard or you have friends that have different breeds of dogs, maybe you just say, hey, would you mind meeting me up at the park? We'll stay safe. We're going to practice our social distancing. But can we, you know, meet and just work together where, again, we're not, they're not actually specifically breeding, but we can actually practice the dogs seeing each other and and again, not breeding. So then that way they can go, hey, I've seen a larger dog. I'm not, these, these things aren't aliens or foreign objects. I'm okay with seeing them. Um, and again, if they are at a, if you do have a longer lead, you might be able to let them get a little closer. But again, I'm not gonna do anything super close or let the puppy get really, really close unless I have a really strong name orientation or hand target, um, which is you know getting the behavior of nose to hand um, on cue. So then that way I can pull the puppy away really quickly if I need to, um, because again, obviously we can't decrease that social distance um, safely. So again, that would be my biggest caveat with doing that because I want you guys to stay as safe as possible. So here's a quick example of a mock dog introduction. Again, it's a short video, so.
And I'm trying to make the puppy move around a little bit. I'm trying to make the puppy go behind and sniff the rear as that's somewhat of an appropriate greeting for dogs to do to each other. So again, um, this puppy was really fearful. I introduced it to another lab puppy for the purposes of the video and it did not go very well. Um, so that's why I had them, the owners stay later and we practice a little bit of this. So um, again, obviously you can't have an unfamiliar person working the stuffed dog, but if you have, if it's you and your children or you and a significant, significant other or a partner or somebody you're quarantined with, you know, you can say, hey, let's, let's order one of these off Amazon or somewhere and let's try and work on this. Um, and then the other person can be the stuff dog and, and again, make it play, <laughs> make it play back. <laughs> it, you know, again, be creative. So here are some video examples of the puppy social breaks. So um, the first one, Oops, sorry. Good, good. Um, and then here I have another, I have a few of these and they're just kind of fun to watch puppies. They were so cute the other day. And you can see Tiffany is, you know, bringing around our little Chromebook to make sure that everybody's puppy gets their screen time. But then that way the owners can see how their puppies do. And again, you can see we do have some of the harnesses on. And again, we there is the concern about potential fomites. Um, again, with that being said, we do have some of those leashes and collars on still, but um, the leashes aren't on, but. So again, just doing a quick scan of the room, checking everybody out. <laughs> that little Yorkie puppy was so cute. He was so worried though, but he, he was a cutie. Oops. All right, sorry guys. So, Creating, again, that safe and healthy exposure for puppies using exploration and familiarization. So again, that's the other part where I'm trying to think about breaking down the aspect of socialization into a few different ways. So again, um, inside the home ideas, I, another wonderful idea from the amazing Debbie Martin was to create kind of a novel room. Like, so every day you have this special room that maybe has some different scents and um, every day, maybe you have different sounds, like maybe you have pet store sounds or you have sounds of birds and um, cats meowing or something. Um, and then you have some new objects, even if it's an ironing board that you open up or you do some different things like that. But again, you're, every day there's something novel in that space. Um, there's also a really cool app that I use. You'll see some video of me doing some sound exposure and coming up. but. Um, it's called Soundproof Puppy. And again, it's a great, great, um, I wanna say it was like $1.99. It's worth it though. Um, and you can, it, it's an app, you get it on your phone and it has tons of different sounds. So like there are things like motorbikes and different things that again, I feel like puppies aren't hearing right now because of the fact, again, I, I don't think many people are riding around their motorcycles. Maybe they are, I don't know. I feel like I haven't noticed anything. Well, they really shouldn't be because if you're an essential worker. I don't know that you'd be driving a motorcycle. I don't know. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But um, but again, you know, I want to make sure that these puppies are getting as much exposure to some of these sounds. Also, airplane sounds are something that they're not hearing a lot of. So again, this app has a lot of really cool sounds, um, and I use it a lot. Um, but again, we want to keep the doors closed every day, just again, so then every day the puppy walks in and something different is in that space. 
or you can do something different outside every day. Um, but again, change is normal and we want puppies to understand that. Um, and then again, outside the home, you're gonna be clicking and treating, for looking, weight shifting, and approaching objects. So again, your goal, and one thing I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of, is that you are reinforcing before the be fearful behaviors start. So even if your puppy goes up and they don't seem super fearful, please still give reinforcement. Um, again, there are times that even if your puppy gets up super close, even if it's just a, a tree or a fire hydrant or something, something may scare them in that moment. And again, you want to make everything as positive as possible. It's not just about exposure to things, it's about positive exposure. So trying to make that experience as, as awesome as possible is, is what you're looking for. So again, and we also just wanna make sure we're not just waiting for them to get fearful first and then starting to add more food. Um, again, importance of sounds, I already touched on that. And again, some field trip ideas, you know, you can do parks, trails, um, you know, again, I don't know, I wouldn't say that you go outside a grocery store forever, but say your significant other is running in and they need to get something, and again, an essential, maybe again, you're following your human safety recommendations in your state or your city. Um, but again, maybe you're standing at a distance and you're just watching people walk in and out of the grocery store. Um, and again, you're reinforcing for cart movement and cars moving by and, you know, maybe seeing ambulances and because again, firefighters and things like that need to eat as well. I know that I just was at the grocery store today and I saw, that's why I thought of that. <laughs> um, but again, you're going to see a lot of different things potentially in that environment that can be helpful. So our first video here is um, a little golden I think I, I'm, I'm the worst I'm, I'm, at being able to tell the difference between a golden doodle and a labradoodle. Um, but this is a doodle. And this just got, runs through showing some, let me pause this, um, just some, again, clicking and treating for interacting with that object. And again, I'm, I'm coaching, mom's reinforcing. So again, this is something that owners can absolutely do. And mom missed a few times. So again, and when I, and, and this is where, again, I wanted to give an example of, of things with objects. It's not like they have to go right up to them and, and you don't need to take like that little car and, and, you know, again, drive it right up to their space. That's going to make them way more scared. And if you looked at that dog, it probably would have made her freak out. Um, so again, that's something where we want to make sure that we, you know, keep a distance and, and again, we're safe, but also I think it actually can potentially be a positive. And then looking here, this is just, again, an example of using some sound work. So again, as a side note, I'll explain it actually after the video. So earlier in the video, again, because I'm I'm only took snippets, um, but. I tried a Kong with fireworks and I put peanut butter in the Kong and I, I feel like 
Again, as easy as a con can look for a dog who's a little bit more stressed, it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, I also had that volume up a little high. I, I probably would have, in hindsight, decreased the volume a tiny bit. Um, but again, I in this situation, I increased the value of the food to the dog. I used cheese and I used a smear bowl instead of using the Kong because again, smear bowls can be a little easier. It's just lickable food right in front of you. How can you turn that down? Um, so again, if, if he would have turned that down again, a lab turning down that type of food, I would have absolutely known that we don't need to move forward and we need to make and tweak that criteria. Oops. So, okay. So again, independence time and alone time routines. So again, we need, even though again, we're in this pandemic, we need to set some sort of a routine to prepare for the outside, for outside of the pandemic. So I'm not saying you have to go and work from your car for eight hours, but I would start to practice leaving the home with your dog in a crate, with food enrichment and leaving during periods of time. I'm gonna say I would do this for even my own dog. This doesn't even have to be during socializ puppy socialization. Um, I, a lot of the VTS and I, or and myself, we met a few weeks ago just to kind of check in on everybody. And we were talking about how much, how concerned we are that a lot of these pup, a lot of these dogs are gonna have a lot of concern with being home alone. Um, because this is, again, is they're, they're living their best life right now. <laughs> you know, mom and dad are home all the time and this is fantastic, but we need to make sure that we set an expectation for the for puppies to understand that this isn't how the world always works. Um, and especially if, again, I've, I've seen rescues that are, again, really pushing the fact of, hey, we're all home, let's foster dogs, let's do this, which I think is great. But again, we need to make sure we're setting a routine and we're used, we're getting animals used to the fact that they are, you guys, or humans do leave. They don't stay at home all day. Um, and again, I have a long time fun. So again, play, you know, put, putting them in a playpen, like Alice Louise's in this picture. That's my boss's, Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Feltis's uh, puppy. Um, but where she's in her playpen, and again, people are present and she's just practicing being away. Um, because again, there's not always going to be times and opportunities where puppy is always going to be around. And when you do have a puppy, as I'm sure most of you know, um, there's a funny meme that I always think is, it's like um, what I thought I was getting and it's a picture of this adorable, cute little puppy that's all cuddly and then, and then what I actually got and it's like a picture of a velociraptor. Um, and again, I, I, when Alice was a puppy, this is like three or four years ago, it, she was, and again, she's still the best dog ever, but you know, I was like, oh, this is so fun. I can't wait. And then, you know, she'd come to the office and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm definitely done with puppy time um, after about 20 minutes, because again, she was a lot and having a puppy is a lot. So being able to have space away from your puppy and keeping them away and teaching them that independence time is good is really, really helpful. And again, that's also going to be immensely helpful for this pandemic. So again, some cues for successful socialization, you know, again, as promised is, you know, teaching things like name orientation. So again, this is useful as an interrupter, useful to get your puppy's attention, like first and foremost. And I'm not talking about, you know, getting an actual recall where puppy comes and runs right over to you. This is just, hi, I know who I am. Um, so I joke. And um, when I'm explaining this to owners, your goal is to capture behavior. So you know, I think of it like anybody who's married or has a partner or lives with somebody, you know, sometimes you get, you know, I know in my house, my boyfriend, Chad will say like, you know, Rachel, and I'm like, usually will roll my eyes. Like, what, what does he need now? And I'll turn my head usually, you know, within, you know, maybe 10 seconds. And, you know, if, if within that 10 second time frame or something, as I turned my head, if he clicked and gave me let's even a quarter I would turn my head much quicker next time. Um, <laughs> again, you could tell that you know I'm I'm in I'm a cheap date. So again, a quarter would work for me. But again, it's just again giving reinforcement and teaching them that hey, I should pay attention when I hear that name. That's important. And what you're doing is you're capturing the behavior of that head turn. So again, if your puppies, so this is Alice Louise again. But say, you know, Alice was sniffing the ground and I said, Alice, and she popped her head up and kind of glanced her head in my direction. My goal is I would click 
the moment that she makes that choice to turn her head. Then I'm gonna get and give her that treat within you know, three to five seconds. Um, the click is the most important part. Again, I can have a whole nother lecture about clicker training. Um, so again, that's, that's a whole nother thing of it in of itself. Um, but then the, you know, the other big thing, um, which there's another book that um, I was reading in preparation and that I wanted to read, it was, it's called Social, Civil and Savvy. And I would absolutely recommend it. I think it's a wonderful book for pet owners. Um, and it, I, she is a Karen Pryor certified training partner. Her name is Laura. And I'm not even going to try the last name because it's, I know I'm going to butcher it. So, but I just wanted to make sure I said the name of the book. There's going to be pictures of it at the end. Um, so again, I really want you guys to look at that because it was a great book, but she talked about a lot about using a nose target or again, using, uh, this is, I use it as a recall. Um, but it can also be really helpful as a greeting ritual. And again, it can be a nice way to, you know, again, be able to get puppy from point A to point B quickly. And that's a behavior that we're typically shaping. So shaping is step-by-step -step approximation that leads to a goal behavior. So again, I, again, I could talk about clicker training, capturing and shaping for, you know, probably an hour. Um, so I, this is really brief, but you're teaching this by almost teaching the puppy to, to understand, wow, when I place my nose at your, um, I usually will like, open hand, closed fist. When I do this, that makes food happen. So this was a few weeks back um, before the pandemic was super, super serious. I was at a friend's house, hence again, why I'm saying that it was before the pandemic was really crazy um, and it got really scary. But um, this is a dog um, and again, she is not a puppy, but I wanted to be able to give you guys kind of, because if I were to use my own dog, he's very savvy and he knows, already knows how to do this behavior. So um, she is, has zero clicker training experience and it just shows, I, I introduced it that day um, when I was visiting with my friend. But um, you can see that again, the moment that I bring my hand out, you'll start, kind of see how teaching the nose target, um, how it looks and how you would start teaching it. <laughs> um <laughs> watching dogs learn makes me so happy i again i am i'm so fortunate that i get to do what i'm passionate about and i just love it so um so again, with this being said, you know, again, I mentioned those two books and I, um, I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions and stuff too. So, you know, again, you can see um, Social Civil Savvy and you can see Laura, bah, I'm, I'm not, I, I just don't want to pronounce her name inappropriately. So um, there is the Social Civil and Savvy book. And then again, Puppy Start Right um, by Debbie Martin, um, who is again, another VTS behavior and I know she does a lot of amazing things with Fear Free. And then her husband is Dr. Kenneth Martin, and he is a um, diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. So um, I joke and I say that they're the, um, the power couple of veterinary behavior. Um, and, you know, we, I laugh. I, I like to make jokes. So um, again, also with St. Bernard's, I love Newfies. They're my thing. Um, a giant breed. And again, if you guys know me or follow me or anything like that, I, I have a, a 20 pound min pin. So <laughs> I love him. I love him more than the moon, but I just, again, I'm really a giant breed person. So um, I know that there are some questions and I know that you guys have a bunch. So I, Jessica, I don't know, do you want to read the questions or how did you want to do that? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start reading the questions to you. So the first one is, I know they recommend starting socialization at six weeks, but how many sets of shots do you think they need before exposing them to the public? So with puppy socialization um, and the American, 
ABSAB, so the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, has a really amazing position statement out. When you start doing socialization or you start kind of doing this familiarization as well, um, I usually say you want your first set of vaccines. And again, you're gonna be taking your puppy to locations that you trust. Like again, we're making sure within our facility right now um, that again, we're using, we use um, rescue and some different types of cleaners to make sure that we're cleaning our facility um, after each puppy is in the area. But again, you're going to put, you're gonna be suggesting places and recommending places that are going to be comfortable um, and that you trust. Um, again, you're, I wouldn't be suggesting to go to a dog park and I would, I would be recommending places that are well-regulated. Um, but again, and even like I said, if you get a six week old puppy, which again, I would recommend that you take a puppy home by eight weeks, no sooner um, for other reasons, but um, at eight weeks, if you get that puppy and they get their first set of vaccines, I think that it's absolutely appropriate to start going out and doing things because behavior and, and socialization is the way that you're gonna do that behavior vaccine. And that's really, really important, but great question. All right, thank you. The next question is, do you agree that most puppies do not need counter conditioning? It is more of a time to classically condition things in our environment? I think, good question. Um, right, you're probably doing a lot of classical conditioning. Um, I, the way I think of it is that you do, it can be classical conditioning or it can be classical counter conditioning. Um, I like to break it down um, to I want to make sure that I'm changing you again, I guess you're right, considering the definition, but I want to make sure that that puppy completely and utterly understands that seeing those things make amazing things happen. And again, I'm not just, I don't want the puppy to just go up to the object or to the potential stimulus and get worried. If they do, then, then we have to back up and do a lot more work. If we start by using desensitization and a little bit of classical counter conditioning, I think it's gonna set us up to be more successful. Great, thank you. The next question is, a vet I know is not encouraging any, any interaction with strangers due to the possibility of fur being a fomite slash the possibility for a pet to carry COVID-19 in their right. nose and transfer to us during interaction later. Is there anything, any current scientific support to disprove this? I am not 100% positive about scientific stuff. Um, I know at our practice, we're following all the guidelines from ABMA. Um, I know my doctor had mentioned something in a consult recently about the potential for the fomite. And again, and I even did some research because I knew people would have, you know, again, as I do, and I've been really worried about animals being a potential fomite. And, um, again, from what I understand is that anything, um, let me see, limit contact with animals until we get more information. So again, for human and human or human on animal contact. And again, that's where what I'm saying is even with humans, you should be keeping that six foot distance for the most part with the puppy. Um, because you're right, I don't, I, at this point, I don't know that we, we are totally aware and we know exactly if, if animals can carry it or not. Um, so we're doing our best to be as safe as possible. Thank you. The next question is, where can we find more information about your virtual classes? Oh, um, that you can find, I will, um, ju if you can, please email me. I would be happy to go ahead and review that stuff with you um, and send you the information. I, if you go to thebehaviorclinic.com, we have a lot of the stuff up on our website. And um, we would also, you can find us on Facebook and we have a lot of our stuff on the website there. Great question. Awesome. Next question is, would you have a suggestion for a puppy who is the opposite of fearful and actually gets frustrated and vocalizes when he isn't allowed to greet a human or another animal? What I would be suggesting is you start at a further distance. I know it sounds even more frustrating because you're like, well, wait, the dog's already frustrated. We have to start at a space to where the animal's successful. So 
if I, if possible, I would be starting at a distance to where the dog is successful. And then I'm going to start to reinforce him for being okay at that distance. Um, if, if you go close enough and you just stood there and, and again, I would be trying to wait for something appropriate. You might be waiting a really long time and that might increase more frustration for the, for the learner because he's going to be really close to the, to the potential stimulus and he's not going to be able to get to it. Um, so again, I think if you can start at a distance to where the dog's successful and slowly decrease the distance and move closer and closer while still reinforcing positive behavior, you would be, um, that would be a good, uh, a good place to start. Great, thank you. The next question is, with the fearful lab puppy and the fake dog, was she using counter conditioning or was she clicking and treating? So, counter classical counter conditioning and so she was clicker she was using clicker training um i was just having her essentially capture behavior again if you were breaking that down i was in that case because that dog was fearful of the dog i would be saying we were using classical counter conditioning um because again every time the dog was interacting with the stimulus i was putting the marker there and then the owner was reinforcing. So in that way, the dog started to learn interactions with that stimulus make good things happen. And again, with the clicker, we're able to specifically reinforce that um, that, that stimulus is what's making the good things happen. You guys are really testing me today with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> All righty. So the next question is, do you tell the clients to wipe their pups down after interacting in the puppy socialization class? You can. Um, I don't think that that would be inappropriate. I know from what I understand, I don't think we have been. I know that there are some um, other places that are doing classes that are like group classes that are very similar. And um, they are using, I believe, the rescue wipes. Um, but again, even with those, I think they still burn a bit. Um, so again, they can potentially be wiped down afterwards with those, but it's not something that we're specifically doing. Um, but I don't think that that's inappropriate. Again, it's just there's, because there's no science about it, it, you know, again, we're trying to do whatever we can to, again, continue to create that positive experience, but um, limit the, try to limit the exposure and, and again, I don't think it's inappropriate to be recommending that. Even if you did like Clorahex or something. Because again, from what I've known and some of the information I listened to one of the other fear-free lectures, um, that coronavirus from what we know is an enveloped virus. So again, some in the way I understood it was parvo is also an enveloped virus. So if you use anything that can kill parvo, parvo virus or things like that, you're gonna be able to kill um, the coronavirus. So again, if you can use something that's not going to be harmful to the puppy after the puppy's play times, I think that's absolutely appropriate to do. Better safe than sorry. On that note, is it known how long COVID can stay on hair coats as, as a fomite? I don't think so, because I don't think that there's any, there's any study yet out about it. Um, I want to say, and I talked to one of our nurse practitioner clients and she was telling me that she's like i want i thought it was a few hours but again i don't know that that was actually again researched yet um because again i i think that not that this stuff is still so new i just think that there's still more that we have to learn um within this pandemic and again it's opening all of our eyes to a lot of new things so um but again i don't think there's any hard research on that yet from what i know all right. Um, the next question is, what was the name of the puppy noise app? Soundproof puppy. Awesome. Thank you. The next question yes. is, our puppy refuses to play alone in her playpen. When we place her in there with toys, Kongs, and other things, she just cries. How can we help her get better at independent play? Ew. I would be, so number one, um, regardless of whether it's a pandemic or not, one thing you can always add in for any new puppy into a home is um, Adaptal by Siva. Um, it's, a, it, it's a pheromone diffuser that helps to reduce stress and anxiety. 
Um, and that's something that, again, it goes 750 square feet and diffuses into the environment. Um, so that might be helpful if for some reason she is a little bit more stressed. Um, I would even try making something, making food enrichment easier. So again, if say you're using the Kongs and, and I would be asking, what are you putting in the Kongs? You know, if you're putting peanut butter in, or you're just putting dry kibble in there, I would try increasing the value of the reinforcer. Um, there would be a lot more questions I would also be asking that for. Okay, thank you. The next question is, would you recommend separating two puppies during in-home socialization? One is shy and one is bold. Essential. Can, wait, can you repeat that question for me again? Of course. Would you recommend separating two puppies during an in-home socialization? One is shy and one is bold. Um, again, it depends. Are they siblings? I, and again, you don't have to answer. I, again, I always like to know more detail, but um, I would, if you have, it, I mean, again, I would be giving them separate times, absolutely, apart. A um, I don't think that that's inappropriate to do. Yes, they're siblings. Um, yeah, I mean, I would definitely try doing a little bit of separation with them. Um, I think that that would absolutely be okay. And I would be maybe going out and doing like some of the socialization stuff without like by themselves and not together all the time because, it, it, and I think that might be more your, your question. Um, so again, that's where I... Oh, good. I'm sorry. I keep looking at the questions. I need to stop because now I just saw that Kendall wrote stuff about the animal you know, stuff. Okay. I'm minimizing it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but my, the big thing was, is that I was, what I was going to say is that I think you should take the puppies out separate when you're going to do things. If you're going to go out and about on a field trip or you're going to do things, I would do it separate because if the one puppy is a little bit more shy, you can actually break things down a little bit more for that individual. And again, the other individual might not be as worried. Um, so again, you're still going to be doing reinforcement, but it may go much quicker. Um, and again, and I think it'll be helpful too for each, for the more shy puppy to learn how to, how to, again, be able to work through these things without having its sibling around. Because again, when you have litter mates in the same home, a lot of the times there's a lot of bonding that happens, which is again, an amazing thing, but it also can, um, where they rely on each other a lot. So it's nice, I think, if you get them separated and you work through that. Good question. Great, thank you. So would you say those are your considerations for all litter mates? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. That was a really good question. I, I'm happy somebody mentioned that. Good, awesome. good question. Awesome. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar tonight. You'll be able to find the recording of this webinar on fearfreepets.com within the next week. Thanks again and have a great night. Awesome. Thank you guys so much.